Welcome back. It is time for Silver and Black today, an Odyssey original podcast, Odyssey sports original podcast covering the Las Vegas Raiders. Thanks for being with us. Scott Branson, along with my co-host Mo Moten. Do us a favor. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast if you don't already do so on the audio side. Just look for it wherever you get your audio. Just search Silver and Black today. Subscribe right there. Put on the auto download. That helps us out a lot. Also, if you're watching us on YouTube or wherever you may be watching us, thanks. On YouTube, subscribe to the channel. Hit that notifications bell and give us that thumbs up. That way, you know, every time we have a new video. All right, we are back. Uh, not much to talk about today again, right? Nothing going on in the in the world of the Raiders. No, I'm, I'm kidding, of course. But we had over the weekend, Mo. By the way, follow Mo on X.com, Mo Moten, M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N. He is a senior NFL writer over at Bleacher Report, also the Raiders columnist at SportsNot.com. You can also catch my work, both uh, written and video format on SportsNot.com as well. Uh, we had drama over the weekend. So we hear Mo first. Let's start with that. We'll get into the actual person who looks, appears to be, unless he decides to pull out too, um, the, the the Raiders to offensive coordinator. But let's start with what happened over the weekend. Cliff Kingsbury, all the reports came out from all the regular NFL insiders that that are rarely wrong. So, you know, everybody could assume that this was happening. Cliff Kingsbury, the next day, I wake up on Saturday morning. Guess what happens? He's withdrawn. He's basically, uh, they had some issues. Different reports say it was a contract issue. We don't have any details of that. We don't have any details. So people are just assuming what it is and jumping to conclusions. But either way, it was a change of heart for Cliff Kingsbury or something happened and negotiations broke down. And so he walks away. He is now going to be the offensive coordinator of the Washington commanders. And and Mo, I just want to get your opinion on this because things happen until the ink is dry, so to speak, things happen, but it's not, I mean, we have not seen this happen in this coaching cycle where somebody's going to be the coach and it's reported widely. And then suddenly it's, it's not anymore. So again, this is another kind of focus on the Raiders. For those of you who don't like the national media treating the Raiders, like it's a circus, this is kind of sort of the reason why. Whether it was his fault, the Raiders' fault, we don't know. And I'm not here to tell you which one it was. But that whole thing, it, it's just unusual, especially on such a big hire for Antonio Pierce. I want to get your thoughts on how that all went down with Kingsbury. Well, the wording is always when you hear about a signing or a, a potential acquisition, expected to hire, expected to sign. You hear this a lot in free agency. Uh, during the more, uh, period where legal tampering period where players can make an agreement, uh, verbal agreement, but it's not official until two days later when the new league year mm-hmm. is actually in, in the swing. So this is while this is rare that you see this, it happens. I remember covering the phrase seeing Anthony Barr did this. I believe he was supposed to go to the New York Jets. He backed out of the deal, whatever. Mm-hmm. But back to the actual Raiders Kingsbury situation. So as you said, it's kind of like a whirlwind of Raiders expected to hire Kingsbury. Vic Taper said that the Raiders were excited and there was a contract breakdown. I I I don't know this for sure. I'm not a reporter, but to me, it seems like Kingsbury simply just chose the better job when it, in terms of access to a top quarterback prospect. Let's remember that he's reported to go to the Washington Commanders who had the second overall pick in the draft. And there is some buzz that Caleb Williams may not go to Chicago or may not Mm. want to go to Chicago. Right. So with a pass, even if Caleb Williams does go to Chicago, let's say he does. If you're Cliff Kingsbury, you're either coaching Jaden Daniels or Drake May, or you're, you're getting Aiden O'Connell or who (laughs) knows what at 13. So who knows? Basically he he said, if I'm Kingsbury, I'm thinking, okay, I have a shot to to coach a top quarterback prospect versus a team that's down in the order and they don't really have a clear future at the position. Mm -hmm. So I think the backing out, while they say it's a contract uh, breakdown, Adam Schefter said it was a contract breakdown. I think Cliff Kingsbury just had a a change of heart uh, when he was offered another job under Dan Quinn, who became the commander's head coach, I believe on Thursday they hired him. Yeah. And that happens, Mo. It's just interesting to me, though, that you would get that far to the point where you're just waiting to sign the contract and then a change of heart. I mean, listen, it happens. I've I've been in the situation where offered a job and was like, OK, I'm going to take this job. And then you wake up the next day and you're like, you know, I have reservations about it. 
And so I think you I think you're right there. I think probably the idea that he was ready to go and then it's like, well, then I think about it a little more and I think about the situation and oh, by the way, I have another offer now on the table from a different team with a different coach and it's appealing to me because I might be able to get a better quarterback. You 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 can't fault someone for that. I know Raider fans aren't happy about it, of course, and I'm sure the coaching staff wasn't happy about it either, especially when you have an agreement in principle. But it happens, right? To to your point. So so is this an embarrassment for the Raiders organization? Is the question because you can't control what somebody's mind does or tells them their gut tells them to do with the job. But we knew this going in too, right? This is not a criticism; it's just fact, which is. The idea that Antonio Pierce, a rookie head coach, and and he might do just great for the Raiders, but we don't know. He's more of an unknown than a Dan Quinn. Now, you could talk to Dan Quinn about his time as a head coach and all that kind of stuff and his time in Dallas as a defensive coordinator, but he's a little more of a known commodity. Would you agree with that? He went to a Super Bowl, Scott. Yeah. Of course he's more of a yeah. known commodity. So right. if, you're, if you're looking at, if you're Cliff Kingsbury and you're looking at, you know, top quarterback prospect, a known commodity who's been to the Super Bowl before with his football team versus Antonio Pierce, who's still relatively inexperienced. And we don't know the quarterback situation is going to be with the 13th right. overall pick in Aiden O'Connell. Again, choosing the better job. And I'm saying this objectively from a quarterback perspective, the Raiders job isn't the most attractive or appealing job for an offensive coordinator. So mm. I'll say this, that no one likes to be stood up at the altar. Right. <laughs> regardless of True. what you think about, regardless of what you think about Luke Getze, whether he can succeed or not. And we'll talk about that. Uh, no one likes to have it where you have your mindset on. This is the person that I want for this situation. And that person tells you no. No mm. one likes to hear no when you want that person. Right. No, of course. Not. So you go to your second option. Now, I also say I don't think that the Raiders necessarily settled for Luke Getzey because let's remember Luke Getzey did interview for the position before Cliff Kingsbury. So Luke Getzey was already on the Raiders radar. He just wasn't their top choice. Correct. And I saw somebody say it's sort of like, you know, you you go and you ask that girl to the prom and she says yes. And then like a few days before the prom, she says, guess what? I'm going with somebody else. So now you got to have to go, okay, who else was I going to ask? And, right, and again, sense, I think. and, and so that, yes, yes. So there, there you go. So, so the situation is that, and, and again, we're going to get into Luke Getze in depth here in segment two to talk specifically about him, but it's it, to me, here's the, here's the concerns I have. And, and if you want to call this negative, call it negative, but this is more of a concern, which is. We know the process by which the Raiders went about finding their head coach. Look, he was in-house. It was easier, right? But Mark Davis said, I was going to do this. I was going to do that. He didn't. Instead, he was convinced by the way that Antonio Pierce um, performed down the stretch with his team that he should get the job. So the whole head coaching search thing kind of changed. Then um, you saw some of this happen with the offensive coordinator. You saw now Marvin Lewis come in as the assistant head coach, and we'll talk about that in a bit too. And so it, it, the process has been, I think, not traditional. I'm not saying it's bad per se. It's just from the outside. And this is what I try to explain to fans when they ask, why are the national media so negative about the Raiders? Well, that comes with not winning for so long, number one. It's just organizations, if you haven't had a lot of success, people are not going to give you the benefit of the doubt. Now you're in a situation where you have a rookie head coach who's defensive minded. We know what him and Patrick Graham were able to do with that defense. Amazing towards the end of the season. So this offensive coordinator hire going into this cycle, the, 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 the common narrative was Mo, this is the most important hire that Antonio Pierce is going to make. It has to be really good. It has to be somebody who's got, who's got, I think the progressiveness that knows current offenses, has some level of success somewhere, and and he's going to need that person to come in and do it because the Raiders' offense was terrible. And then we have the misfire with Kingsbury, and then we get Getze, who was just fired a couple months ago in Chicago for not advancing their offense fast enough. So when you look at it from the outside and you and you try to evaluate it, people have to understand that on the outside, it doesn't matter if he's well-respected, which is just cover for covering for your your sources, by the way. But if you look at that, you look at that, it's 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 concerning just because that was supposed to be the key hire and it hasn't gone well. 
And Luke Getze might succeed, Mo. We don't know, right? We don't know until he gets a team on the field. It's impossible to say, but people need to understand why it looks so weird from the outside. I mean, from an outside perspective, you're looking at it as, oh, the Raiders Raidered again, because I saw that <laughs> message a lot on social yeah. media. And I think this is something that was just out of the Raiders' control. There's, as you said earlier, there's nothing you can do to help control or control a person's mind. Correct. Uh, so a, a lot of people want to say, you know, Cliff Kingsbury at first, good hire now. Oh, we don't need the hire. We don't need Cliff Kingsbury in the air raid offense anyway. I still believe Cliff Kingsbury would have been a solid hire. I believe he was my second best option mm -hmm. of the offensive coordinator uh, options that the Raiders had, candidates that they had um, after Cliff Kubiak. But uh, he, he goes to Washington now and the Raiders move forward with Luke Getze. And as I said, we'll talk about how Luke Getze could be successful, what his offense looks like. But mm. if, you, if you're looking at it too from the outside, you're thinking – Luke Getz's offense in Chicago didn't look good. And the Raiders had to settle for their, not settle, but the Raiders had to go with their second option after they wanted to hire Cliff Kingsbury. So, of course, from an outside perspective, it's not going to look like a smoother, good uh, move for the Raiders. Well, and I think, I think too, it just, it's, it's one thing after the other. And I agree with you. I don't think it's their fault. When a guy has a change of heart, I don't think you can blame the Raiders for that. The no. situation the Raiders are in, their position in the draft, their current roster, that has a, to do with it. So in, in that way, if you want to blame the Raiders, I guess you could. But again, that it is what it is. You, you're in that situation. And so so whoever came in to interview for the job knew that coming in. They knew exactly where the Raiders were. So the Ra it wasn't like the Raiders did a bait and switch or something. So I agree with you. I don't think you blame the Raiders for this one. I think fans are just so used to things, the floor dropping out. Mm -hmm. And people are and, – and the media too. They're just so used to – you talked about it as Raidering – I think that's why, even though this is a much different situation, so I, I'm not going to be hard on the team because Cliff Kingsbury pulls out at the last minute. That's just what he did. Uh, the hire of Getzey, on the other hand, is a different story. And again, we're going to get into that fully in depth here in the second, the second segment. But I think the levels of, hey, we're going to do an exhaustive search for head coach, and then they interview two candidates at side. Now, again, they felt like they had their guy. I would have much appreciated. They had to go through the process, obviously, because of the Rooney rule. But, um, you know, it just seems as though that that went a little bit strange. And then some of the other things that have happened, you hire a running back coach, Deshaun Foster, which I think is a great exam, a great addition to the staff. But you hired that before you hired your offensive coordinator. It, it's sort of it's sort of strange. And, and of course, Chip Kelly was interviewing. Now we heard on Friday or excuse me, on Sunday that one of the reasons Chip Kelly wasn't a choice for the Raiders was he wanted to bring most of his staff from UCLA to be on his defensive or excuse me, on his offensive staff. And apparently that's reports that we've seen across the, the web from, from reputable sources or excuse me, reputable uh, outlets saying that that's why he didn't get there, but they hired Deshaun. F it's just, to me, it's weird. You hire a running backs coach before you have your offensive coordinator. Usually the offensive coordinator comes in, they fill out the staff based on what what who they want to bring with them number one and number two there might be people that Antonio Pierce goes to him and says hey man Deshaun Foster is interested in coming here would you be interested in having him as running back coach would you have that didn't happen so the Raiders hiring order has been a little scattered it's been a little scattered we don't know what the you know what the arrangement was or how you know yeah. a guy was interviewed or would you be interested in working with this person or that person mm. so I won't I won't really comment on that because we don't know what the back channel discussions were Right. What I will what I will say is is that looking at the the now the second option for the Raiders in Luke Getze, you look at his track record and you can start to see what the Raiders offense will look like, which we'll talk about. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of a lot of people were disappointed simply because of how it went down in Chicago. Let's remember he was fired from Chicago after two seasons working with Justin mm -hmm. Fields and, Ty and Tyson Bajan, who actually beat the Raiders in week seven this past season. But if you're looking at the numbers from Luke Getze's offenses, uh, not very inspiring. No, and we're going to get into that right after the break. Good segue, of course, Mo. See, Mo knows what he's doing. He's a professional. He's a, gotcha. Okay, gotcha. we're going to take our first break here on uh, this edition of Silver and Black today. Coming to you on a Monday. Yes, we're recording it Monday morning. We're releasing it Monday morning-ish, depending what part of the country you're in. So if you missed it on your morning commute, at least you get it on your way home. Uh, as well as the video up on YouTube. So make sure you check it out if you haven't already done so. When we come back, we're going to get into the Luke Getze file. We're going to talk about his time in Chicago. We're going to talk about uh, his offenses. We're going to talk about the numbers 
And we're going to talk about some of the reasoning why he might not have succeeded in Chicago. There could be numerous reasons, not just him, but other reasons, too, that are outside his control. So we'll talk about that when we come back. This is Silver and Black Today, an Odyssey original podcast. We're coming back right after this. Welcome back. Silver and Black Today, an Odyssey sports original podcast covering the Raiders. Scott Branson, and Mo Moten with you. If you don't already subscribe to the podcast, please do us a favor and do so wherever you get your audio. And thanks for the subscriptions up on YouTube. Hit that like button, that thumbs up, and also the notifications bell. That way you know every time we have a new video. Okay, but we talked about the drama on the hiring of all this stuff going on with Kingsbury and, of course, now Getsy. Now, uh, Getsy still has not been announced officially. And there are some out there who say you should never listen to anything unless it's officially on this on the team's website. But guess what? We have a lot of folks, Mike Garoppolo. I mean, all the guys, the insiders at the NFL network who work for the league, by the way, have reported this. So we, we anticipate it's going to happen. Uh, but you look at Getzey in Chicago, he's fired last month, uh, to, as, as what people have described underwhelming two year stint with the bears as their offensive coordinator. They did show some growth under Luke Getzey. Very, very little 2022. This team averaged 19.8 points. Let me, let me flash this up here. We got a graphic for folks to look at. So for two years with the Bears in 2022, 19.2 points per game. That's 23rd yards per play. I'll go into that. Red zone, uh, again, uh, opportunities in the red zone per game, 2.9. That was 19th. You go to this year, some improvement. They went up nearly two points in scoring, but still 19th in the league. Uh, their yards per play went down. By, by almost a half yard, and red zone stayed about the same, and they were 20th uh, with red zone opportunities per game uh, in this in this season. As a play caller, Bears finished 21st in EPA per play, which was behind the Raiders, and 24th in success rate, uh, which was uh, also behind the Raiders uh, this year on offense. So overall, not good number. We'll talk about the reasoning, or at least some of the reasoning behind this, but I think that when you look at this, this is why I called the hire uh, again, Mo. I called it uninspired because of what we had seen there. Now, does that mean he can't be successful? No, we don't know that. But you look at uh, I'm looking at the the report from Tashawn Reed and uh, and and Vic Tafer where they talk about the the Bears' offense as being quote entirely one dimensional. They led the league in both rushing attempts and rushing yards. Uh, and they had uh, they had this what they called an elite rushing offense. Although their leading rusher was their quarterback, Justin Fields, uh, but they were dead last in both passing attempts and passing yards during that span. We heard we heard uh, um, Antonio Pierce Mo talk about how he wanted a coach that was going to score twenty four points, all that stuff. We also heard him say uh, this that he said that uh, let me see let me get the quote here exactly because I don't want to misquote. Uh, Coach Pierce on this, but he basically said, "Hey, look, I want a guy who's going to go down, who's going to be creative, who's going to challenge, uh, uh, challenge vertically. All this kind of stuff." We heard from from uh, uh, Antonio Pierce. Uh, here it is. He, he said, uh, "Quote: You've got to be able to run the football, play action pass. Uh, what are the Raiders known for? The vertical passing game. We want to see shots down the field. We want to see explosive plays. That has to be part of the creativity. You look at the shifts, the motions, all that stuff that goes into it." when you think of the Raiders are playing really good football and that's what we got to be, that's what we going to be your offensive coordinator, hopefully as we go forward. So you look at that now, I know from, from limited, just from yesterday, looking into Getzi's offense, even though it wasn't very successful, he does use motion. There is some things there. It's Kyle Shanahan's kind of West coast offensive flair to it. Um, just wasn't able to execute it in Chicago. And we'll talk about those reasonings, but give me, give me your sense for, you talked about maybe seeing a little bit of what the Raiders offense can look like. Um, give me your take on Luke Getze, what he does offensively, and and does it fit with that kind of viewpoint that Antonio Pierce had? I think Luke Getze stylistically or schematically fits with it, what Antonio Pierce wants to do. Antonio Pierce, the first thing he says is you got to run the ball. And this is why I said Eric Bannemi wasn't a fit for the Rays because Eric mm -hmm. Bannemi's commanders were last, dead last in running the football last year. And players even complained to the media that the – that the commanders and Eric Bambi should have ran the ball a lot more. Yep. So that's the first thing he said. And Luke Getzey, I know Justin Fields was the lead rusher for the Chicago Bears, so the numbers, the rushing numbers for the Bears are skewed a bit. But the Bears plan to run the football if you look at their personnel. They have three running backs that they use. They rotated, I believe, Khalil Herbert, 
uh, Dante Foreman, and they drafted Roshan Johnson out of Texas in the third round yep. this past season, this past last offseason. So they have three running backs along with Justin, Justin Fields who can move the football with his legs. So looking at that personnel, the Bears intended to be a physical run first team. And I think that fits with what Antonio Pierce wants to do. The other thing that I think works in Luke Getty's favor is that he uses the tight end in the passing game. If you look at Cole Komet's progression over the last two years, he became a viable red zone threat. I believe he had 13 touchdowns over the last two seasons. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he showed progression. So that, that's a good sign for Michael Mayer. The other thing I want to point out is that I believe in 2022, the Bears ranked, I believe, in the, within the top 10 in RPO plays. Intended RPO pass attempt, so run pass option. And that's another thing that I think you're going to see with the Raiders – Offense, and I think people get this idea that with the run or with the RPOs, you need a mobile quarterback. Not necessarily. You need a quarterback who's going to make quick decisions and be able to read defenders. I think that's the key staple of our RPO heavy offense. Yep. Not necessarily a mobile quarterback, but again, quick release, quick decisions, and you can run that with Aiden O'Connell. But if you have a mobile quarterback, it gives you that third option for the quarterback to keep the ball and run with it. So it gives it adds an extra layer to the offense. So I think you'll see more RPOs out of the Raiders. Now, will it be with a more mobile quarterback? In my opinion, I think so, because Luke Getze, when he was the offensive coordinator with Mississippi State in 2018, he had Nick Fitzgerald. And guess what Nick Fitzgerald did, Scott? He led the team in rushing. So he, yeah. just like Justin Fields this past, uh, in 2022, he right. had over 1,100 rushing yards for Mississippi State. So I, in my opinion, with Luke Getze coming in, I think you're gonna the Raiders are going to start a more mobile quarterback than Aiden O'Connell. And there's a possibility that that quarterback is going to rack up a fair amount of rushing yards on the ground. Yeah, and it's it. I I get that too, but I wonder, I because I he I keep hearing people when I talk. We talk about look at the numbers, the leading the leading rushing teams in the NFL: Ravens, Bears, 49ers, Cardinals, Lions, Dolphins, Bills, Eagles, Falcons. Right. So you look at and then the Colts. So you look at that, the Bears were number two, right? But the Bears were at the bottom of the barrel when it came to passing. And you can say, well, yeah, but the, look at the Ravens, look at the, look at the 49ers. But those teams are also in the top five and top ten in passing. There's a balance, right? And I think that's what we heard. Why One of the reasons Getze got fired was he couldn't get the balance in that offense. And the biggest criticism of him was that he, wouldn't, he couldn't or wouldn't, we don't know because we weren't there, adjust the offense based on the personnel he had. And so when you look at that, to me, that's the biggest red flag for me. It's not, it's not whether, because coaches go places sometimes, they don't succeed. It's not always their 100% their fault, but do they improve, number one? And number two, are they, are they able to adjust based on the talent, right? We saw Josh McDaniels not do that at all. In fact, he would sit down talent he had just because he didn't want to deal with it. And, and it was a disaster. So that, to me, talk about that, because to me, that's the biggest concern. Because if he if, if Luke Getze comes into to Las Vegas, and let's say the Raiders aren't able to do something at quarterback. I'm not saying they won't. I'm just saying, let's say, let's say it's Aiden O'Connell. Then then he's going to have to adjust that offense, because he's Aiden O'Connell's not running the ball, and he's not functionally mobile either. No, and I think when it comes to personnel and what happened in Chicago... I want to be direct when I say this. A lot of people want to know, was it Justin Fields' fault or Luke Getze's fault as to why the Chicago Bears' office didn't improve the way people in Chicago wanted it to? And I think usually it's – and I said this to you off air one time, Scott. I said mm-hmm. when things don't go right, it's never – is hardly ever just one person or one Correct. factor. It's right. usually – both factors or a multitude of factors that pa- factor into failure and as well as success. Mm-hmm. So I, I think I don't think you can completely absolve Luke Getze because you think Justin Fields stinks. And I don't think you can completely absolve Justin Fields because you think Luke Getze stinks as a play mm-hmm. caller. I think it was Great. a little bit of both of them because I, I remember distinctively remember this during the past season that Justin Fields came out and I don't want to say he criticized his coaching staff, but they asked him, you know, you know, why is he being too robotic? And he kind of pointed to, you know, I guess in differences with the coaching staff, how players are being called. And then he had to clarify his statement because it came out that Justin Fields is throwing his coaching staff under the bus. So he came <laughs> back, called the yep. media back and clarified that statement 
to say, I'm not blaming the coaching staff. And I, and the, this is the way I read it as maybe there's just too much going on in his head where he's trying to be a pocket passer, not run so much when he's comfortable running the football and using his legs. And I think that offense and with Luke Getzey leading it was trying to help him become more of a proficient pocket passer. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't working out for him. It wasn't until he let loose and started running the football again that that Bears offense started to roll. Now, of course, Correct. he had he was also injured and he had to get back on the field. But Justin Fields does best when he's able to force defenders to defend him on the run. And that worked out well for him. And I think there were periods last season where Luke Getzey went away from that and it didn't suit his quarterback strengths. Correct. And we talked about in, in, in our conversations here on the show, talking about the Raiders possibly going out and getting Justin Fields as somebody to come and compete, not as the long-term answer per se, could be, yeah. might not be. It's not going to happen now with Getzey for sure. But at the same time, when we talked about that, we talked about lack of development and that sometimes a different place, a different coach, a different staff can help you find it, right? I mean, not guaranteed, but, but and so obviously he's not going to be on the Raiders, so we can drop that one. But you we also look at this because I saw a lot of this conversation. Well, yeah, they sucked passing the ball because Fields was terrible. It was terrible. It's not, it's not Getzi's fault, but look what he did. He had the second best running team. That was also field. So you can't, you know what I'm saying? I mean, yes, you can't have it both ways. You can't give Get Getsy credit for having a great rushing offense and then blame the quarterback when the quarterback was the one who made the rushing offense, by the way. Exactly. So again, it goes to show the nuances, right? Which is which is your point, which is it's not one person's fault. It's also the head coach's fault. The head coach oversees the offensive coordinator. Why didn't he push Getsy to do things differently? That's on Eberflus. That's not on Getze per se. That's not on field. It's not on the players. So again, it's it's a situation where you have that. So we ha we ha we have to look at that. But you look at Getze's record there. A lot of people, well, Devontae Adams loves him, and 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 uh, Aaron Rodgers loves him. He's like, yeah, but he was the passing coordinator. Very different role. We all we can go on is two experiences with that. Now again, Antonio Pierce doesn't have a lot of experience either. But we have. We saw him coach nine games in the NFL. We kind of know what he does, his style, the things he needs to learn. Then we look at Getze. You talked about his college experience. Let go after one year. He only lasted a year. Then he went back to the NFL. Then he gets the, the Bears job. He lasts two seasons, and he's gone there. Again, people fail a lot and then succeed. So I'm not saying the guy can't succeed, but I think this is why there's some, there's some concerns there. He's going to have to come out and prove it. He's going to have to do something. And if the Raiders don't get a more viable, I think, quarterback for the year 2024, he's going to be in an even deeper hole to me, Mo, because what do you do then? Then you're limited. Now, we don't know. They might go get a veteran. We don't know. But still, there's just a lot more open questions. And I think going into this offseason, the combine here in three weeks, then the draft, it's just really, really interesting to see how this coaching staff has come together because – I think everybody was looking for a really strong um, offensive coordinator that had, that came in with a bunch of ideas, which is why I was in favor of Kingsbury. I, I kind of called that out. But somebody else that was kind of at the forefront of offenses recently that had some sort of success, even if they weren't a coordinator and they they moved up. And with Getzy, I think it was just kind of a dud for people. Doesn't mean he won't succeed. It just it just kind of fell flat. With Getzy, he's kind not kind of he's. An unknown, even though he, as I pointed point. out, he was an offensive coordinator with Mississippi State. And then he had two, he had years with the Packers, was never the primary play caller with the Packers. Mm -hmm. Passing game coordinator, very different than the offensive coordinator. While he does have input, uh, it's not the primary play caller where you say this oh. was his offense. Oh, and he had Aaron Rodgers too, by the way. And he had, yes, and he had Aaron <laughs> Rodgers. So that, that brings me to my point that. Who the Raiders start at quarterback is going to ultimately determine how successful Luke Getze is mm -hmm. as the Raiders offensive coordinator for 2024 and beyond. I, I, I'll i use Josh McDaniels as an example, right? This is an extreme example, but it's still a good example. Josh McDaniels is regarded as one of the best offensive coordinators slash play calls in the NFL with Tom Brady, right? He got Mac Jones to a Pro Bowl. He had Mac Jones playing at a Pro Bowl level. People say Pro Bowl doesn't mean anything. Look at Mac Jones's numbers Since. under Josh McDaniels. They were pretty good. Yeah. And then he comes to Las Vegas. He gets Jimmy Garoppolo, who I feel is a big product of Kyle Shanahan's play calling, and Aiden O'Connell. And all of a sudden now his offense is broken. 
Mm-hmm. Josh McDaniels didn't forget how to call plays. The difference is the quarterbacks that he had. So when you have when it's the same thing with with other um, offensive play calls slash head coaches. Sean Payton had Drew Brees in New Orleans. He's looked at as oh the Saints' offense, one of the best in the league, revolutionary. He goes to Denver. While Russell Wilson's numbers were decent, the offense doesn't look anything close to what it looked like with the New Orleans Saints. No. Why is that? Different quarterback. Yes. You go from a Hall of Fame quarterback to a really good quarterback, but not a Hall of Fame quarterback, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. So with Luke Getz, he's the same thing. He had Justin Fields in Chicago, and we all know Justin Fields has his flaws. Absolutely. But if the Raiders get a quarterback who looks like C.J. Stroud in his first year, all of a sudden Luke Getz is going to look like a genius. <laughs> if the Raiders get a quarterback who isn't ready to start right away, whether it's a vet, whether it's a rookie or a veteran who – who doesn't play well, then Luke Getz is going to look like a bust of a hire. But he's at the mercy of the quarterback position. Because, again, your quarterback determines so much. What is the old saying, Scott? It's not all, sometimes not all about the X's and O's, it's about the Jimmy's and Joe's. Yep. The Raiders need to find their quarterback of the future, and it has to be a viable quarterback. Because if he's not, the offensive coordinator, whoever it was, is going to fail. Mm-hmm. If that quarterback shows promise and makes some strides early in his career, then the coordinator will look like a decent hire. We'll see. Yeah, well, but but also the coordinator that that is absolutely true. But also the coordinator has to have the right environment. What you saw, yes, immense talent with C.J. Stroud in Houston, but also the right situation, right? We talked about this with Fields in Chicago not being the right situation. Mm-hmm. But if you bring in a young quarterback, you have to develop him. The offensive staff not only calls plays there, Mo, and takes advantage of their talent, but also has to put them in a position to be successful. We saw a little bit of that, I think, at times this past year, even though Bo Hardigree's gone now. With Aiden O'Connell in certain games, when they game plan, they had a good game plan coming out to take some pressure off Aiden O'Connell to help him be successful. Mm-hmm. With a young quarterback, especially a, a guy who's going to be mobile like that and 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 talented, if they're able to get somebody in that realm, they're going to have to be able to develop them too. That's that's partly the issue there is you have to be able to do that. That's what we talked about with Kingsbury. One of his positives, he had plenty of negatives too, just like we saw from his time in Arizona. But he did develop quarterbacks every stop of the way. And so that's why if the Raiders were going for a young quarterback, you're like, okay, that makes a lot of sense in addition to his 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 play development. So it, it's going to be interesting. We don't know what will happen. So much has to happen. The offense, not only do they have to finish the rest of the staff, Mo, but they have, they're dealing with three free agents on the offensive line. I think they probably just keep one of them or resign one of them. Who knows? They could sign two. They're going to have to get better in the draft there as well. They have needs. You know, people, I've seen people say, well, now this team is a championship team. I don't think so. I think it's close or closer to that, right? It's closer to the playoffs than it is from not being in the playoffs, I think. <laughs> but but you need to find that offensive line. You need, we talked about this in the trenches, but you need to find that quarterback. I'm concerned about the quarterback situation here because I'm not, I don't know what they're going to do. We don't know what Tom Telesco is going to do. That's why he's got the job. We're not the GMs. But we'll see. I mean, I think we'll see coming out of the combine. We'll hear a little bit about who they like, who they don't like. And and you can take that at face value because, or I should say with a grain of salt, not at face value because you don't know, right? There's a lot of misinformation that goes around too as these teams jockey, even coming out of the senior bowl. Um, but but this this situation with Getze, I think some people are disappointed. Again, I just said uninspired hire. That doesn't mean he can't be successful. And so we'll have to wait and see. That's the only thing we can do is wait until they get on the field And I will continue to repeat what Antonio Pierce has said, Mo. Resume on the grass. So you can't can't judge anybody on this coaching staff until they start playing again and we see the results we get from both sides of the ball. Right. But going into this, there again, I I want to reiterate this. There are a few things I expect. I expect the Raiders to go with the running back by committee. I know we expected that mm-hmm. when, when Josh McDaniels came in. Yep. I fully expect that the way Lugetsi handled the running back room last year in Chicago with three running backs rotation. Uh, maybe Josh Jacobs is back and he pairs up with Zamir White, but I expect the Raiders to have a, a new lead pass catching back if it's not Jacobs or, or Zamir White, whether it's through the draft or the veteran. I do expect the Raiders to add another tight end. Austin Hooper is going to be a free agent. I talked about Luke Getz's uh, ability to develop Cole Komet. I know he has Michael Mayer, but I think the Raiders add another tight end. Mm-hmm. And the other thing is, I sh- and this is probably the most important one, because I always say, talk about functional mobility. I don't think Aino Kyle is going to be the guy for the for the Raiders starting week one. Not because you need a, a, a mobile quarterback to run an RPO-heavy offense. 
but just looking at Luke Getze's history, again, I go back to Mississippi State. I look at Aaron Rodgers. I look at Justin Fields. Mm-hmm. All of those guys are either called dual threat, were called dual threat quarterbacks, or functionally mobile. Aaron Rodgers, more functionally mobile, not a dual threat quarterback, but probably the most, the prime example of a functionally mobile quarterback. Doesn't run a lot, but uses his legs to extend plays and extend plays for his all receivers downfield. So looking at Luke Getz's history of where he's been and who he's coached, I expect a mobile quarterback in there to push for the number one job. Absolutely. I think it's a must. And we keep saying it. Not everybody agrees, but we keep saying number one priority, functionally mobile quarterback. It's got to be for this Raider team. Now with Luke Getzey there uh, as well, you you got you to upgrade the position. Again, um, I, there are some folks out there who think Aiden O'Connell's the answer. I just don't agree. He's part of the answer, i.e. in that quarterback room, not only as a good, mature, young guy, but also as a quarterback who can come in and win games for you if you need it, if somebody's hurt, but but not not the answer. So we'll see how the how the Luke Getze thing goes. People are disappointed. Some people, not all, some are disappointed. Some are not. Some are in the wait and see, which is fine. I think the wait and see is where we're at now because what else are you going to do? We, we, we talked about the hiring. We talked about how he got hired. We talked about his record. And so now he's got an opportunity to start with a clean slate with Antonio Pierce and this coaching staff, and we'll see where it takes him. All right. So we, go ahead, Mo. You got one more thing before we cut to the break? Yeah, quick thing. I said this on the night, the day that Luke Getzi was hired, that the people who are disappointed with the hire, give it 24 hours and it will convince themselves that it was a good hire. <laughs> it, it always happens. It people does. will just be disappointed with a signing or a trade acquisition or a hire because it wasn't their choice. Mm-hmm. And then after 24 hours of cooling off and the motion wears off, they're like, you know the- what? He's a Raider now. We're going we're gonna to support him and he's going to be great. That's usually what happens over sure. the course of 24 hours. And I get it. Yeah, because you have no choice. I mean, it is what it is. They hire, they're going to hire him. So it's like, exactly. he's your offensive coordinator until he's not. So you have to, you sort of have to get used to that. And we'll see. We'll see what he's able to do. To me, it's going to be fascinating. I think we're going to get some, we'll get some clues as we start to get into the acquisition period, players, the draft, all that stuff on what this offensive roster is going to look like. Because there's going to be, cha- as you mentioned, there's going to be changes up front. I think there's going to be changes at running back, changes at, at tight end, even some additions, I believe, at wide receiver. So we're going to see how that all flows together and, and how Luke Getze influences that uh, with, with Pierce's staff. So it'll be interesting how that all goes down. All right, we're going to take our final break. When we come back, we're going to talk about what players the Raiders might be interested in targeting based on this hire now, based on Luke Getze, based on the offense. Mo got into a little bit, talked about RPOs and talking about the style of quarterback. We'll delve a little bit more into that here in our last segment. Silver and Black today, welcome back. Welcome to February. Listen to these messages, and we'll be right back after this. One, welcome back. Home stretch here on Silver and Black today on a Monday. Yes, I know you're saying, wait a minute. You guys usually are Tuesday, Thursday. Yeah, we were recording this Monday morning. We're getting it out right away Monday because of the news over the weekend and everything that's going on. Plus, it's sort of the off season. So that's how it is. We get past the Super Bowl. Mo and I are probably going to take a week off, so get used to that for a little bit so we can uh, just focus on some of the other things that we do for a living, but that's okay. We won't abandon you. We'll be back right after that. So stay tuned. Do us a favor. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast wherever you get it. Also, do us a favor. Have some conversation with us. Don't be a snapper head, but but follow us on x.com, Mo Moton, M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N. I am at LV Gully, and the show is SNB Today. All right, Mo. So we talked about it, the Luke Getzey now offense. We start to think about the NFL Combine is just about just over three weeks away. I'm going to be up there in Indianapolis too, so I hope to get to be able to talk to some of these guys that the Raiders might um, might target. But we talked about quarterback last time. We saw the Senior Bowl this past weekend. Spencer Rattler was a player of the game. A guy I've seen some Raider fans talk about. When you look at the rankings, he didn't make the rankings of the top eight we talked about last week when we were looking at possible quarterbacks in the draft for the Raiders. Uh, And that's what the Senior Bowl game does, right? The Senior Bowl tends to bring players to the forefront sometimes who are ranked based on their numbers in college and all that stuff. And then they get in front of all these college, or excuse me, pro coaches and scouts for a week and and they start to climb or fall down the 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 list. Spencer Rattler is one of the guys who rose up there. We saw Bo Nick struggle early in the week, come back strong in the week. We also saw Michael Penix Jr. with the same thing. Mixed reactions on both those guys. 
But um, you, that's and these are the guys I'm talking about because I think the top three are out of reach for the Raiders. I just don't see it happening unless some big, big deal happens. And I think the chances of that happening are probably less than 10 percent. So if we focus on the 90 percent, you're talking Knicks, you're, you're talking Penix Jr., you're talking guys like Rattler and others, Pratt from Tulane. Um, knowing what we know about Getze and his system, I think those guys fit that system because they are more functionally mobile. We talked about Penix and his injury history, but uh, I continue to think that if they're in the range and Bo Nix is there, uh, he's probably a guy that they'd want to to target. But give me give me your thoughts after what you saw this weekend. Yeah, I agree. So first of all, I want to say that Bo, both Bo Nix and Michael Penix had a mixed bag mm -hmm. performance in totality overall. Matt Holder. My buddy Sobo, they were out there in uh in Mobile, Alabama, and they they wrote about a lot of that. But mixed mixed bag, but they both ended, as you said, on a high note. I will say I think, and I agree with you on this, I think Bo Nix can run an RPO heavy offense. I think Bo Nix is a fit for Luke Getze. And shout out to Raider Erie who listens to this show because I'm gonna I'm gonna use the line that she makes fun of me for, but <laughs> Raider fans aren't going to want to hear this, but I, I honestly think that J.J. McCarthy is in play for the Raiders mm -hmm. with Luke Getze there because J.J. McCarthy, I think, can also run an RPO-heavy offense. If quick you release. What he did in Michigan, yeah. quick release, run-heavy offense out there in Michigan, and he didn't have to do too much. So he wasn't right. throwing the ball 40, 45 times, and I don't think with a Luke Getze offense, you're going to get a quarterback who's going to throw that much. He's going to be a complimentary piece, at least early, especially if he's a rookie, to the run game. So I think J.J. McCarthy also fits that mold. So a lot of people who are criticizing Bo Nix for a bunch of screen passes and short passes, that's what Luke Getze's offense looked like in Chicago yes. this past season. Uh, and that so wasn't it, just because Fields wasn't performing. It was right. That's how it's designed. Right. And, and I think there, there was one instance where I think Chicago played Minnesota. I think Chicago won the game. It was like 12 to 10. It was a very low-scoring game. <laughs> And Justin Fields didn't wow anyone with his throws. It was a bunch of short throws, and it was a bunch of, of passes at or behind the line of scrimmage. So, again, if you, I, I know Antonio Pierce talked about the vertical pass game, and I think you can build off of play action yeah. and, and do that. But at first, early with a rookie quarterback, I think you're going to get a lot of short passes, a lot of high completion throws, uh, a, lot of, a lot of stick routes, hitch routes, a lot of RPOs with quick passes out to the flat. You're going to see a lot of that. And I think when you look at the rookies, I think Bo Nix and J.J. McCarthy fit that. Because, again, with the RPO heavy offense, you don't necessarily need a mobile quarterback, but you need a quarterback who has a very quick release, mm -hmm. makes quick decisions, and can read defenders. Because if that defender is crashing in, that quarterback can either throw or he can keep the ball if he's a mobile quarterback and run with the football. So there, there is going to be – there that quarterback is going to have some quick decisions to make. There's going to be a lot on his plate. But again, quick release, quick decisions. Right. You're not going to see you're not going to see offenses like Miami or Dallas or Houston or even San Francisco. Uh, and I know a lot of people criticize Brock Purdy because they say, oh, he's dumping it off, dumping it off. But that's part of that offense. It's basically the same offense. It's a derivative of it. And so you look at that and you look at those quarterbacks and I think you're right. So so if you the Bo Nix, the J.J. McCarthy that that mold is going to be what you what you probably get if they do that. I'm just questioning Mo whether or not even at 13, if both those guys are there, which seemingly they could be, um, if the if the if the Raiders go quarterback, um, I, I just don't. I mean, it's such a glaring need. You would think, of course, you're going to go quarterback. I don't know. Do they go in the trenches? Do they go offensive line? Do they go defensive line? And then. Uh, but I think if you if you default on the quarterback and you say, well, we're going to go later, to me, then you're putting a lot more pressure on Aiden O'Connell and your front office to find some sort of veteran that's going to come in and help out. Well, the first thing that has to happen is free agency. So I Correct. think what, what the Raiders do at free agency will will tell Tip you kind of what what their draft plan is. If they mm -hmm. go after a a high end free agent quarterback like Kirk Cousins then it's more likely that they're going to draft a quarterback outside of the first round. If they don't sign a quarterback in free agency or it's a quarterback like Jacoby Brissett, then it's a higher probability that they go early with a quarterback. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the, the fluid thing here is you don't know where these quarterbacks are going to land. 
a team may trade up even before the draft, throw a monkey wrench in a lot of other teams' plans. There's going to be a lot of rumors about this team's looking at a quarterback. This team is going to move up into the top 10, and they'll leave us in suspense going into draft day. When it comes to Raiders at 13, I think Bo Nix is a possibility he could be available. But I will say this again, and I said this last week, don't be surprised if the Vikings or the Denver Broncos draft Bo Nix and move yes. up into the top 10 to get him. Yep. I think Bo Nix is going to go a lot earlier than people think. I do too. When it comes to J.J. McCarthy, I think J.J. McCarthy is going to be there at 13 if the Raiders want him. If the Raiders are very high on J.J. McCarthy, I wouldn't be surprised mm -hmm. if the Raiders draft J.J. McCarthy at 13. Scott, I'm oh, really quick, Scott. I'm old enough to remember when the J J Jim Harbaugh rumors were floating around and people were saying, we no. don't want Jim Harbaugh because he's going to draft J.J. McCarthy. How ironic would it be that Jim Harbaugh goes to the Chargers and the Raiders still draft <laughs> J.J. McCarthy at 13 with Luke Getzey as their possible. coordinator? I think it's, it's possible. possible. It's very, it's possible. very possible. And that's what's going to be interesting, though, too, because because we look at, as we talked about in the last segment, Mo, Getzey's system, and, and you're talking about those screen passes, especially with a younger quarterback, um, and how it operates with the RPOs. And and I want you have to look at it from the totality too of the division. So look at the division. How's that offense going? You look at the Chiefs defense. I know they, they might lose a couple of key pieces once the Super Bowl is over. Um, but you look at Denver's defense, they're a little bit in flux as well. You look at the Chargers defense, um, and and you start to think, does that offense play well in the AFC West? Now, the Chiefs offense fell back this year and they're still in the Super Bowl because the defense has been so good too. They've had balance basically. Um, the Chargers defense has been brutal, obviously, especially late in games. They have not been able to close the door. How does that offense fit in the AFC West? Because at the very first thing you got to do is you got to be able to tr hopefully try to win the division so that you get a better seed in the playoffs. It's going to be tough sledding because you got Steve Spagnuolo in Kansas City. Uh, you, you know, you got uh, Vance Joseph in, out there in Denver. I, I didn't catch who the Chargers has have as their defensive coordinator, but I would assume Harbaugh is going to assemble a, a pretty good it's staff a, it's, over there. Uh, what's his name from Michigan that was with him at uh, Michigan? Mil Milton. Mark. I thought. Okay, so there you go. He's gonna he's gonna put together a quality staff. So with so with that said, I, I think with the Raiders having a potentially a rookie quarterback or eight and O'Connell, you're gonna have to. I think fans are going to have to adjust themselves to an offense that may not be explosive right away, even though they have Devontae Adams, Jacoby Myers, and Trey Tucker. I think with a rookie quarterback or Aiden O'Connell, you're going to be a run-focused team, and you're going to attack yeah. those teams on the ground. And we saw this with the Kansas City Chiefs during the year. Even this past season, with their defense that has been pretty good this year, one of the best units in previous uh, seasons, the way to attack the Kansas City's Chiefs defense was right up the middle running the football. Now, we'll see if they lose Chris Jones. If they lose Chris Jones in free agency, more of a reason why you should run the football against them. We saw this against yeah. Denver. Denver Denver Broncos had one of the worst run defenses this past season. Now, I'm sure they'll add players to kind of help that area and bolster their interior run defense, but you run the ball at those teams. The Chargers have been known for being a soft team defensively. Mm -hmm. I'm sure Harbaugh will work on that at bring some toughness to Los Angeles. But all three of those teams in recent years have been susceptible to the run. And I think with the Raiders offense, again, with a, with an inexperienced quarterback or even Aiden O'Connell, who has not even a full year of starting experience on his resume, you're going to see a run-oriented team. Because I think that's what Luke Getzey said when he got to Chicago. I saw his introductory or his first press conference when he was the Bears offense coordinator. Mm -hmm. He said, we have a physical football team. And he wanted to lean into that. He goes into Las Vegas, and we all know what, how Antonio Pierce ran that team after Josh McDaniels was fired. Physical football team. So I think you're going to see similarities there between how the Raiders, between how the Bears built their offense with Luke Getzey and how the Raiders will build their offense with Luke Getzey in the upcoming year. Yeah, and, and I agree. I mean, we, we've heard it, and I know I've heard from fans, so, oh, I'm excited. It's going to be run-first offense, and you have to, but you also have to pass the ball. It's the modern NFL, right? So, so you have to be able to do it at key times. And if you're, but if you're able to establish your offense, and like you said, especially against some of those teams, get that run going, get it moving so that you can take some of the pressure off the quarterback, especially if it's a young quarterback, then I think you're in a good spot. But I think the AFC, look, the AFC overall, you, you can look at the AFC West, you can look at the Raiders getting better, but man, the AFC, again, you're going to have a Cincinnati team next year with Burrow back 
with additions there. You you have some AFC teams that are going to get better. You still got Buffalo. They got a lot of issues to deal with too. It's just a tough, you talk about tough sledding. The whole entire AFC is tough sledding. So the Raiders are going to have to figure out, in my view, I think they, they have to maintain what they've built on defense and they have got to get much, much better. You can't move up a spot or two or three on defense. I mean, excuse me, on offense. You got to make a jump. You got to make some kind of jump. And if that's through running the ball, primarily, great. But you got to be able to do that. You got to be able to score points. You got to be able to score points in the red zone, which they have not been able to do over the last couple of years. So we'll see. I mean, like you said, will free agency will start here in another month. And then we'll start to see the the pieces fall into place. And we'll get a better sense, as you said, for where the Raiders are going to be going uh, as far as their their roster building goes. Most important thing for Luke Getze is he's got to figure out the passing game. Luke Getze yeah. has shown that he could develop pass catchers. Uh, Devontae Adams, uh, he was Devontae Adams' wide receiver coach in Green Bay. Devontae mm-hmm. Adams, I'm sure, uh, praised Luke Getze for his development early in his formative years. I talked about Cole Komet's development as a tight end. So Luke Getze has shown that he can develop pass catchers in an offense. Yes. The question is, can he put the, can he put the talent together to field an offense that can move the ball through the air because that's been his issue. Even going back to Mississippi State, there were complaints. If you look back at reports, there were complaints that Mississippi State has this dominant defense, has a strong run game, but they struggle in the passing game. Nick Fitzgerald had regressed as far as his completion rate under Luke Getze. Mm-hmm. You get to Chicago. I know he was a pass game coordinator in Green Bay, but as you said, he had Aaron Rodgers. He ain't going to have Aaron Rodgers in Las Vegas. <laughs> so when you look at the Chicago Bears offense, that offense struggled again vertically in the past game now some of that is because justin fields has his flaws but also you can't as i said earlier you can't completely absolve luke getzi and i think when luke getzi comes, comes to las vegas gotta get the quarterback right and gotta get that quarterback to be able as you said to move the ball through the air because you have to have balance and tony pierce talked about it have to be able to run the ball have to be able to use the vertical passing game yeah it's interesting and, and i'll close on this one because i think for me the question marks and some of the doubt that I have just internally. And again, I'm not emotionally attached like a fan. So I look at it differently than some of you out there who are watching or listening might. Is just uh, you have a very personality driven, tough, defensive minded, first time head coach in Antonio Pierce. And he surrounded himself now with people that he knows from the past, i.e. Marvin Lewis, some of these guys, which is a good thing. You talked about this before, the mentorship, somebody there you can really trust and bounce. We all have those in our lives. Very, very important. So I think for, for me, the offense and some of the other positions, I was looking for progressive um, minds, new minds with experience though, not, not somebody who had a couple years experience. I was looking for somebody who might be able to come in, has somewhat a track record. It doesn't, doesn't have to be a perfect track record, but just somebody who's known for kind of pushing the envelope, pushing things forward at the forefront of where offense is going. So to me, that's why I called it uninspired. That again, doesn't mean that people don't change. It doesn't mean that the situation might allow him more freedom than he had in Chicago. So he might be able to adjust. We'll have to see. We won't see until we get to August and September. So it's going to be fun. We're going to have a fun off season. And of course, we're going to get um, later in the week, we're going to get a mailbag show. We'll just do a quick mailbag show for you as our Ooh. schedule kind of starts to wind down a little bit. Mo and I got a lot of Super Bowl coverage to do this week for our respective employers. So we're going to be all over that. But we will get back to some of your messages because you have a lot of it. By the way, make sure you call in 702 702- 900 702 900 7869. That's 702 900 7869. The number's below in the description of this video as well as the podcast. If you want to take a look at that, you can also mail us, email us at mail at silverandblacktoday.com. That's mail at silverandblacktoday.com. Mo, you got any uh, bleacher report stuff you want to, or sports not stuff you want to call out to people here early in this week? First of all, I want to thank everyone who joined me on Bleacher Report on the live show that aired 1 30 eastern time 10 30 pacific time i know for the pacific coast west coast people that's very early so thank you for getting up with me early <laughs> monday morning uh i also i'm gonna have a sports not speech coming up talking about the positives and negatives of luke getsy because i know there are some people out there who just want the positives and there are some people out there who just are negative through and through oh we have luke getsy our offense is gonna stink and I just want to give an objective, straightforward point of view of what to expect, not necessarily telling people what to think, but just giving you, as we went through today, some of the principles of a Luke Getzey offense and what it could look like and who he could bring in. 
and how the offense could operate with that quarterback with a new tight end with another uh running back in the backfield so i'll go over that in the sports not pete's uh on thursday that will drop as i said i'll promote the, i'll push the link out there so for the people who again want the positives with mm -hmm. luke Getzey, you can read it there for some people who want a more critical view you can also read it there It'll all be in the same column i will call it straight down the middle as i always do balanced don't be so negative be balanced <laughs> strive for balance absolutely always strive for balance like offense and defense strive for balance uh no mo i appreciate it make sure you check out all that stuff uh and follow mo on x.com at mo moten m-o-e-m-o-t-n t-o-n excuse me i am at lv gully it's monday sorry and uh we will talk to you guys midweek with a mailbag show quick nice fun mailbag show and any news that breaks here uh, with the Raiders over the coming time. My friend, have a great rest of your week. Same to you. All right. For everybody out there, thank you for joining us. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your audio. And if you're watching us on YouTube or wherever you're watching us, make sure you subscribe, hit that thumbs up, and don't forget to put on notifications so you know every time we have a new video. We appreciate you guys. As always, thank you so much for the great conversation over the past week with all that's been going on in Raider Nation. We don't always agree, but I always respect varying points of view as long as you're not a snapperhead. That's it. That's all we ask. Don't be a snapperhead. Okay. <laughs> Everybody have a great rest of your week and we'll talk to you soon.